Who is coming? Where is he coming? How is he coming? When is he coming? And why is he coming? Are just a few of the questions Pastor Mark Byers addresses in this important topic, The Second Coming Reexamined. Hello and welcome to another Kingdom Living broadcast from Calvary Christian Church in Royal Oak, Michigan. Right now, let's join Pastor Mark as he expounds more on this subject of Christ's second coming. What you have through the Word of God is this covenantal thread that literally weaves through the Word of God with one message. If you want to be part of my family, You've got to do things my way, and if you don't do it my way, you aren't part of my family. When God said that he was going to give aid in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, to Abraham and to his seed, he was talking about those that believed in the God of Abraham and followed him, God did not offer salvation for everybody. He has excluded anybody who's not part of the family. He said, I will bless all the families of the earth through you, And what he did is he entrusts to Abraham and his family the covenant of salvation through Messiah. They became the stewards of it, the keepers of it. They were the ones who were constantly in charge of that covenant, making sure it was preached. And let me say this to you. If you weren't part of Israel, you went to hell. In the Old Testament, if you were not part of Israel, you went to hell. This is not some New Testament doctrine. God only saved one family. Initially, the covenant with Adam was one man. The covenant with Noah was one man. The covenant with Abraham was one man. And, you know, you could say, well, that's an unfair thing. I don't believe that. Well, you know, Noah is said to be one who is a type of the second coming. Like in the days of Noah, so shall it be also the coming of the Son of Man. How many of you realize that Noah was preaching a message and he said this, either get in this boat or you're going to die. And people said, that's not politically correct. <laughs> Noah probably looked at them and said, how long can you swim without food? I'm telling you, there's only one way to get saved, and that's get in this boat by faith in the coming Messiah. Listen to what God said. The Lord, our God, has promised he's going to destroy the world. Get in this boat or you can't be saved. They laughed at him. So what does the Bible say? Only one family on all the earth was saved. It's as though God could say to Noah as well as to Abraham, as like he did Israel, you only of all the families of the earth have I known Because you embrace the message. Those of you that are sitting here today that think you're going to escape are as foolish as the people in the days of Noah who thought they would escape. If you don't make the decision to join up with Israel, the family of God, you're going to hell. If you don't make the decision to join up with the only family that's going to be saved at the coming of the Lord, you're going to eternally spend your life in the lake of fire. And you can mock and say, you're just a snorting, hellfire and brimstone preacher. I don't mind being called that at all. I'm not here to please you, nor to be politically correct. I'm here to deliver the word of the Lord. And I say to you, if you are not part of God's family, you're going to go to hell. And I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how nice you think you are. If you are not part of the family, you're going to hell. And when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to rescue only his family. And when we get to that point in the history of the world, we're going to be wanting to be rescued and we're not going to even want to stay here anymore. Why does God choose only one family? Because he's humble. He doesn't mind starting things out small. He's not a seeker-friendly church who spends six months in pre-advertisement and buys the building and starts out with a big bang. He starts out small. And isn't it interesting that the 11 apostles were the sons of one man, Jesus Christ, and he committed the whole 
kingdom to those 11 men. Small beginning. But they began to preach the message that if you did not become part of the family, you were lost. And there were literally thousands who began to embrace it. In the Old Testament, the sign that you believed was that you were circumcised. And if you were not circumcised, the Bible says you were cut off. Genesis 17, 14. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. You were either circumcised in the Old Testament and joined Israel, or you weren't part of the covenant. And if you weren't part of the covenant, you went to hell. In the New Testament, we are told that we too are to do something in obedience. And Colossians chapter 2 tells us, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The New Testament says that the New Testament equivalent of circumcision is water baptism. Say, am I saved by water baptism? No. You're saved by faith, but if you have faith, you obey. Later on in the covenant with Abraham's children, Moses came. We can't go in depth in this, but when Moses came, he added the law to their requirements. And he said, if you don't keep the law, I'll cut you off. In the New Testament church, we have the law of Christ. And the Lord is saying, if your faith does not produce obedience and you do not keep the law of Christ, you're going to be cut off. As a worker of iniquity. The Lord says, be part of my family. There has only always been two ways in the world. God's way that led to heaven and the flesh's way that led to hell. I want to take just a few more minutes and talk to you from Acts 15. There's much more I could say. I've got to skip over a lot of scriptures such as the ones in Exodus and Ezekiel that make it clear that if you were outside Israel, you could become part. And when you became part, you were to be treated as a natural born Israelite. That's what it says in the book of Exodus 12, 48 and 49. But turn to Acts 15. I want to point out to you something in Acts 15. There's a conflict that goes on in Acts 15 in the early church. I'm going to try to quickly make you understand this conflict without going through laborious details essentially there was this host of gentiles that ultimately israel realized were included in salvation that they too incidentally could become part of israel they realized that all the gentile nations could become part of israel and they could be grafted in and that's what the story of cornelius reveals that all the gentiles could become part and they were astonished at that and they realized wait a minute god is opening the family to the whole world they've got to become part of israel so they become part of Israel, except in Israel, there was a group of people who said, if they are Israelites, then they have to do this. They have to keep the law of Moses, and they have to be circumcised. Acts 15 is really misunderstood, I'm convinced, by a lot of people. Essentially, the interpretation of Acts 15 is that these, now listen carefully, these Jews who were insisting that the early church be circumcised and follow the laws of Moses are branded in this scripture, Judaizers. They were going back to the law. And they were to be categorically rejected. Well, let me just say this. The question was so ambiguous, and the answer so ambiguous, that the apostles called a conference of all the leaders in Jerusalem and invited the Holy Spirit to help them understand the answer to the question. Now, us modern 20th century Christians would have answered it in about three sentences. You silly Jews, don't you realize that it's Judaizers that is trying to push this on you? And forget it, that's all done away with. There is no reason to even give a moment's notice. In fact, if you even call a meeting to answer this question, you will probably give credence to it. Just throw it away. But for some reason, the apostles knew the answer to this question was so big, it required a general assembly of all the leaders. Also notice this, that when the apostle Paul would encounter error, he would just write a little letter. Don't do that anymore. That's wrong. Here's right. 
But all of a sudden, this question of whether they should keep the law and be circumcised was so big, they called a conference of all the apostles, and they met in Jerusalem and had a big confrontation, and they began to debate it, and according to Acts 15, it was pretty intense. Chapter 1, verse 15, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 5, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, some of the Pharisees made it, rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. No, it's heretical Judaizers. Why don't they just be quiet? Well, those apostles didn't just dismiss them quite that easy. And there is a reason. You know what the reason is? For 1,500 years, if you did not get circumcised and obey the law of Moses, you weren't part of the family. And they knew it. They knew that for 1,500 years, only a circumcised member of Israel who kept the law of Moses could get into the kingdom. And they needed to get an answer from God because they knew that to do anything other than that was in disobedience to the scriptures. And so they began to seek the Lord. Verse 7, it says, And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. It wasn't quite a ridiculous Judaizing heresy. What it was is they knew that God was doing something new in the earth and they needed to know before God that God was setting aside the requirement of circumcision and the keeping of the law that they had held to for 1,500 years to be part of the family. And they weren't about to do that carelessly. If you were a Gentile in the past, you had to do those things to be part. And now it seemed as though God was saying no longer is that necessary. Let me say this. A few short years earlier, anybody who taught that would have been absolutely correct. Because before the cross, the only way in was circumcision and obedience to the law of Moses through faith. And those were not what saved you. It was faith in the word of God and the coming Messiah that saved. It wasn't those works. The works were evidence of the faith. Abraham was justified by faith. Let me read to you out of the book of Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work... But believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. They were saved by faith in the coming Messiah, and the fact that they believed it, they proved it by being circumcised and keeping the law. When an Israelite offered an animal, he had no confidence whatsoever that that animal was going to forgive his sin. He had confidence that what the animal represented was going to forgive his sin. It represented the coming Messiah. And he believed that the Messiah would be able to forgive his sin. And the Messiah would cleanse his sin. He only offered the animal to prove he believed in the coming Messiah. And the Israelites who offered the animal, according to Romans, thinking it provided it, did not ever enter into the righteousness which is by faith. All of a sudden God comes along and says... No more animal sacrifices, no more necessity to keep the law, and no more need for circumcision. You are circumcised by water baptism. Your sacrifice is Christ the Lord. And if you believe that, be baptized and take communion as a sign that you have entered the family. James makes it very clear in chapter 2. Do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? Listen to this. And by his works, faith was made perfect. Faith is not faith unless it produces works. Anybody who says they're saved and lives in sin isn't saved. A lady called me one time and said, I, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. But I've been a mistress to a married man for 14 years. I said, no, dear, 
you're going to go to hell unless you change your way. He visits me three times a week. I, I'm a Christian. I, I know I'm a Christian. No, you're not a Christian. Faith without works isn't just sick. It's dead. It doesn't exist. Do you see that faith was working by, together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. What the scripture is saying is we want to join up with the family. We better have some works to prove we have joined up by faith. People think they're going to play with God. There's an awful lot of people going to hear, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You're not saved. You never were. And you never had works. We are baptized and obey the inner righteousness of Christ because we have believed in the Messiah. Works of obedience prove to God and to us that we have genuine faith. When God brought Abraham out, he ushered in a new day. He drew a circle around him and said, anybody that wants to be part of my family can be, but they're going to join up my way. New covenant, new message, new family. He opened the doors for all the Gentiles to come in. A merciful, wonderful, gracious plan. Are you part of the family this morning? Or are you kidding yourself? Are you part of the family and do you know that you're part because your faith is manifested by works of righteousness? Or are you living in sin and immorality, wickedness, disobedience, rebellion, all the time thinking you're okay? Let me assure you of this. When Jesus Christ comes back, there will have been such terrible tribulation that the only people left serving God are going to be true sons of Abraham. People who are willing to die before they give up their citizenship in the family. I believe we are about to enter in to the greatest days of tribulation this world has ever known and don't let a distorted Bible teacher convince you otherwise that you're going to be gone. I'm going to show you from the Word of God that that doctrine is simply not sound biblically. I will not need anything other than just the plain Scriptures. I will address their favorite verses. I'm going to talk about it for three or four weeks. When you're done with the three or four week session on when Jesus is coming, I believe if you are a reasonable person, you will have thrown out the pre-tribulation rapture, which incidentally is only popular in the U.S. and wherever the U.S. has promoted it. It's not popular around the world. Theologians have rejected it. George Mueller rejected it. And there's an awful lot of people who have a false conversion with a false confidence that they're part of the family and they're not part of the family. They've never been genuinely born again. They're false converts. They're convinced and not converted. And there's a day coming when the Lord is going to sort it all out because when tribulation comes, the false converts will abandon the faith and the falling away is going to take place. A falling away that's going to stagger the people's minds. And here's what the scripture says. Two years before the earthquake, the shepherds will mourn. Why is that thrown in the Bible? I'll tell you why. Because by the time we're a year and a half into the tribulation, false shepherds who have produced false converts are not going to have any converts left. My goal as a pastor is this. That every member of my flock will somehow know and be prepared for the coming of the Lord and the three and a half year trial that will take over the earth just before it happens. And there are false shepherds by the thousands this morning producing sheep who are not prepared. Their minds are set. They're out of here before the trouble begins. Let me tell you, the big trouble is about to begin. And when it does begin, false converts and people who aren't truly part of the family aren't going to be in church any longer. And if you don't think the days are going to be tough, we started out with this verse. For the elect's sake, I'm going to shorten the days. And what he's saying is this. If he didn't shorten the days, listen, here's what he said. 
no flesh would even be saved or alive. We are living in perilous times. The Bible says in the last days perilous times will come. That word perilous means fierce. Men's hearts are going to start failing them for fear. And if God didn't shorten the days that are about to come upon us, there wouldn't even be any flesh left on this earth to inherit the world. There would be nobody alive for Jesus to catch away when he comes. But he's going to come. And when he comes, he's going to complete the saints, conquer the devil, condemn the ungodly, consummate his marriage, command the world, and rescue his family. Are you part of the family? There's only one way to be part. That way is to put your faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one who was holy enough to pay the debt for your sin and mine. He's the only one who was the spotless man who could become the lamb who died for you. He's the only one who was righteous and therefore could become a substitute because he did not have to die for his own sin. He had none. And then God, who designed this whole plan, said, if you will believe in the Son and His sacrifice, I will include you in my family. All you have to do is believe, and if you believe, prove it by being baptized. And if you believe and are baptized, prove you continue to believe by taking communion. And obey me by fellowshipping with my saints and seeking to learn to walk my way. That's the way to salvation. Submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Surrendering your life. To the king of kings. And if you don't do that. You will be as bad off as the people are in the days of Noah. And you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And loathe the day you were ever born. That isn't politically correct preaching. There's been a pressure from the socialist liberals to silence that kind of preaching for decades. Trying to mock the preacher who preaches about hell. But the Bible's full of the topic. And hell is a place to be shunned with all that's within you. It would be better to never have been born than to be born and spend eternity in the lake of fire. Somebody says, oh, well, the lake of fire. The liberal will say, that's just, that's just figurative speaking. All right, fine. It's figurative. If that's what you want to believe, believe that. That's fine. It's figurative. But the only figurative language Jesus could use to properly communicate the agony of hell was a lake of fire. So whatever it is, if it isn't a lake of fire, it's as bad as that. And you will loathe the day you were ever born if you aren't part of the family. And when he comes, he is only going to save his family. Just like in the days of Noah. That should cause anyone here who's not saved to get a hold of one of the leaders of this church before you walk out of this building and find out what you've got to do to be saved. And it should cause everyone in this church who is saved to get a burden for every friend, relative, and neighbor, parent, child, or whoever, and begin interceding and praying that God will bring them in before it's too late. And become a missionary in your heart and soul. God is going to save one family. And by his grace, I'm part. By his grace, many of you are part. But I have a suspicion there are some in here this morning that aren't part. I don't believe in altar calls that presses people to come down with just as I am without one plea and gets them to make a decision under duress. I say to you, like Jesus, when he was done preaching, if people were interested, they would go and see him after he was done. If you want to accept Jesus Christ this morning, I am available. I am ready. I will spend all afternoon with you. I won't eat today and tomorrow if you want to talk that long to get you saved. I will do whatever I can to help you into salvation, but I'm not going to force you or move you with emotion. You need to make the choice. I'm going to serve Jesus and submit to his lordship and become part of his family. Me and all the elders of this church will work with you. If you're not part this morning, the rest of you, you need to get a burden for your loved ones like you've never had because the day of the big trouble is right around the corner.
Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Just what comforting words was Paul referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, just listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He encouraged them to rehearse this event in their minds so as not to be disheartened and fall away under the trials of everyday life. Let's also gain comfort as Pastor Mark Byers expounds more on this triumphal event in his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. This morning, we're moving on in the series of the second coming of Christ in the book of Revelation. Some of the things that I'm going to say today have their foundation in things that we have said already. I hope that you'll be able to follow along with me and not become too shocked at some of the things I say, because some of the things that I say that may be shocking are based on things that we've already examined very, very carefully in the scriptures. What we have looked at so far is who's going to return, where he will return, how he will return, and why he will return. But now we want to look at the most controversial question concerning the return of Jesus, and that is when he will return. And by when, I do not mean what year or month or day. I mean in the calendar of end-time events, where does the coming of the Lord for the church fit in? The question is, does Jesus come back before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation? And then there's three other questions. Does he come back before the millennium, after the millennium, or without a millennium? Does he come back and just simply set up his eternal reign? There is no doubt there is universal acceptance in the body of Christ worldwide. I don't know of anybody who's a Christian who doesn't believe Jesus is coming back. They don't disagree on that issue. They only disagree on the when he's coming back and what he will do when he comes back. But the main issue, the main disagreement is when. Quite frankly, that's a very volatile situation when we talk about when he's coming back. There are people who are very, very argumentative and very offended if you don't agree with their position as to the when. Let me assure you of something. There's a lot of positions regarding the when. There is different interpretations with different names attached to them. And these are not small groups of isolated fringe Christians who believe these different positions. These positions are held by major portions of the body of Christ. And quite frankly, you may be surprised to know that the most popular of these, which is dispensational premillennialism, is not one of the most powerful or most accepted worldwide in the theological circles. It is here in the U.S. in a lot of ways, but even here it is not accepted. And I will be giving you a list of about 60 names of major leaders who do not embrace and have not embraced dispensational premillennialism. There is classical or historical premillennialism. That position is this. That position holds, and I'm going to put a little diagram up here. Hopefully we can get this to show up on the overhead properly. In this particular diagram, what we have is a timeline, and I'm only drawing this to help you visualize the different opinions. Timeline from the death of Christ until the end of the age where the eternal new heavens and the new earth, where Satan is cast in the lake of fire, takes place. From the cross to the end, to where we are right now, has been approximately 2,000 years. There are concepts about the end, and I today am going to build a foundation from which I'm going to teach the when using a foundation I build today. So if you're looking for all the answers today, you're not going to get them. You're going to get more questions than you are answers today. 
Because if I don't bring some questions to the table and then answer those questions, I don't believe that many people will be able to even accept anything I have to say. I've got to answer some questions that are asked or are presented before people will even begin to question whether their position is wrong. But I want to delineate for you today the different basic positions. Classical or historical premillennialism is a post-tribulation concept, which simply means, looking at your chart there, that Armageddon takes place, and as Armageddon is gathering on the horizon, post-tribulation believes the tribulation has all taken place, Armageddon is literally in the process of forming, and the Lord comes back at that moment. That is post-tribulation. It's a very popular doctrine, and quite frankly, that is the most historical, going all the way back to the early church, and I'm going to tell you right up front, I am a classical or historical premillennialist. I believe in a millennium. The premillennial position is that the coming of the Lord takes place, and that whether it's seven years before this event that, you know, as the premillennial pre-tribulation rapture group says, the fact remains is there is going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ, which we have already looked at in our previous studies, and we will see it again when we get into the book of Revelation textually. The fact remains is, is that this historical premillennial position is this, that the church was started by the Lord, it goes through all the ages, through the tribulation, there's a rapture at the very end of the time, at which time Jesus comes, conquers the Armageddon warriors, sets up his kingdom, and rules and reigns for 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, he allows Satan to be released for a short period to gather those who are willing to be deceived out of the earth. He then casts them and Satan into the lake of fire, creates a new heaven and a new earth at the end of this thousand year period, and sets up his eternal kingdom here on earth. And heaven, and this is one thing that many people do not understand from scripture, heaven literally comes to earth. And we have already looked, and I'll just mention this for those of you that are here visiting, if you're theologically minded, let me just say this, we have already looked at this, and the idea that there are two Israels is just simply not biblically sound. There is one Israel, and we're going to make reference to that again in a few moments with a diagram, but there isn't an Israel in heaven and an Israel on earth. There's one Israel, and God is going to come to earth, and heaven becomes earth, and literally the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit put their throne on earth, and earth becomes heaven. We have seen that from the scriptures already. We've just simply accepted the scriptures. And let me just say this again. I said this many weeks ago. I believe end time doctrine has been messed up and made difficult to understand by theologians who are reading things into the scriptures rather than letting them reading things out of the scriptures. Instead of interpreting what is written, they decide to make it say something that's not there. And they've made this tremendous series of different theological positions. And I quite frankly believe it's a lot more easy than they have made it to understand. Now, dispensational premillennial pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, which is quite popular in the U.S., which incidentally is the foundation of the Left Behind series or the movie The Thief in the Night, most of those movies, The Apocalypse and so forth, these movies are all built around premillennial pre-tribulation rapture dispensational doctrine. Their concept is Christ died, established the church, and that any time during the last 2,000 years, without warning, Jesus could have come for his church, raptured the church, started the tribulation, seven years of judgments fell on the earth. At the end of that, Armageddon was gathering. Jesus comes back physically, literally, and with the saints that were raptured seven years earlier and raised from the dead seven years earlier, and the ones that were in heaven were joined with them. And they all come back together and set up the kingdom. And then the millennium begins. The big difference between what that theology says and what I personally believe is that there is not a seven-year gap between when Jesus comes back and when he sets up his kingdom. I believe he comes back and sets it up. And that may be very, very radical to you. That is not some radical position of Mark Byers. That's a very historical position. In fact, I'm going to show you in a few moments how new the premillennial, pre-tribulation, rapture, dispensational doctrine actually is, because we're going to look briefly at its history. Then there is a post-millennial position. The post-millennial position is a little bit different than the other two. In fact, it's significantly different. It believes this, that the church literally will conquer the world through evangelism, 
And let me just say, this is not some isolated opinion. There are major respected theologians that if I name some of them, you would know their names. If I name them right now, most of you would know the names of men that I could name. They are post-millennialists. And what they believe is that the church through evangelism is going to spread the gospel throughout the world. And through the influence of the gospel, they're going to begin conquering the world for Christ. In other words, how many of you at one time was an enemy of the Lord, wanting nothing to do with God, and now you're sitting in church for two or three or four hours. We start at 10 and you get out at 2.30 usually by the time you leave fellowship. You're here for four and a half or five hours. And some years ago, you wouldn't have thought of going to church for 30 minutes. How many are in that state right here this morning? See, so God's done a work. And so the idea is of a post-millennialist is that God can do that on a worldwide scale and bring such repentance to nations that the whole nation will turn back to God. Can you imagine if the entire Senate, Congress, Supreme Court, and President, and all legislators, and all leaders of the executive branch, and all the states got saved in a matter of six months? Do you think there might be a dramatic change in the government of the U.S.? Well, the post-millennialist believes that through evangelism, the church is going to literally do that very thing and usher in a 1,000 year or maybe a figurative period of time where the Lord's kingdom rules the world through the evangelistic efforts of the church at which time he comes back and they have scriptures for this. I'm not in any way making statements to belittle them. They're very intelligent men and they have very good presentations of what they believe. They believe that then they will literally, the Lord will conquer the earth this way. And then through his church, he will present the kingdom to the father. Jesus comes back, takes the world over and the kingdom is set up eternally at that point with no thousand year literal reign taking place after the rapture. So their concept is the millennium is before the rapture and lasts for a period of time. And then the second coming takes place and it's one coming. He sets up his kingdom and the devil is thrown in the lake of fire at that coming. Then there is the amillennial position. The amillennial position simply believes there is no millennium. They don't believe that the church has to conquer the world. They don't believe that the church has to evangelize. They believe that the things are going to go on and Jesus is going to come back, set up his eternal kingdom, and that's the end of time. These positions also have one other. Or there are fringe positions. There's another position that's fringe, but it's a little more well-known than others, and that is premillennial mid-tribulation. On the chart that you have there, what you have is you have the premillennial position of the dispensational pre-tribulation rapture group. The second coming takes place before the tribulation. There's a seven-year period where it ends with Armageddon. The Lord comes back at the end Again, the second time, the first time he comes in this theology in the clouds, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the second time he actually comes in, not in a secret rapture, but in a visible public rapture and sets up his thousand year millennium. There is a group that is really mid tribulation people, and they believe that the rapture takes place just before the abomination of desolation or right after or right before somewhere in that area. And the concept of almost all people who believe in a seven year tribulation is that in the middle of the tri the first three and a half years, even the premillennial, pre-tribulation, dispensational, premillennial people, they believe that the first three and a half years are basically a lot of peace. The Antichrist deceives the Israelis and sets up a kingdom of peace. And he has this covenant that they suppose he's going to make. And the temple will be built. And there's going to be great peace in Israel. And then in the middle of this great peace, this Antichrist turns. He becomes demonized or Satanized, literally. And... He offers up a pig on the altar that is built in this temple. And that begins what is called the Great Tribulation. And that period lasts for three and a half years according to that theology. There are those who believe the rapture is before the seven years. There are those who believe the rapture is three and a half years into the tribulation. And that's called mid-trib rapture. And then there is post-trib rapture, which believes that the whole tribulation takes place. Armageddon is literally gathered for battle the armies are gathered at Armageddon, the mountain of Megiddo, in the valley of Jezreel. They're ready to attack, and the Lord comes back and puts an end to that kind of activity. Now, as I said, the most well-known, because of the media attention and the publicity that it's received, is the dispensational premillennial position, which believes Jesus can come back at any second. 
He can come back right now according to their theology. He could have come back yesterday. He could have come back 500 years ago. He can come back anytime he chooses. And that all prophecies that are unfulfilled in Scripture are all related to what takes place after he returns. So there is no prophecy needing to be fulfilled at this point in their theology. Therefore, Jesus can come back right now, and then he begins fulfilling the prophecies that need to be fulfilled that are yet unfulfilled. Uh, the history of this doctrine is rather amazing. I'm going to call it pre-tribism just because I don't feel like saying premillennial pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. I'm just going to call it pre-tribism for a, a short without any disrespect. I call myself a post-tribism. I'd call us that too. I'm just using this as a word to describe this particular theology so you know what I'm talking about. The thing that most people who hold to that doctrine do not know, and it is now starting to become public, is that it was never found in the history of the church in any writings in any period before 1830. Now there is some shroud of mystery over who originated it the very first time. Some believe that a little lady named Margaret MacDonald was the one who did it through a vision. But I will guarantee you that Margaret is not really the founder of this doctrine. I'm going to mention to you in a few moments some books that you can read on this that gives the historical setting. But the fact is, it was never, you cannot find pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, pre-tribism in any of the writings of the church for the last 2,000 years almost until 1830. And in 1830, it was introduced by an individual we'll mention in a moment. I'll tell you where it was introduced. And from there on, it became extremely popular. It has spread all over the world. And it is now considered, when I was a young man, in the circles that I walked with at least, if you doubted it, you were suspect as far as Christianity goes. And the teaching was promoted particularly by the radio through the early 1900s, the 20th century. It was promoted through radio and the media and the electronic church promoted it worldwide. And there was also some other factors that promoted it. And I'll tell you what they are in a second. This doctrine divides the second coming of Jesus into two comings. I want to give you a little brief description of its doctrine. It divides the second coming into two comings. And please, if you are a pre-trib, premillennialist, dispensationalist, I beg of you for your sake, listen to what I'm saying and don't just shut me off. I'm not here to attack you. I believe that the men who believe this are good men. The men who nurtured me in my youth spiritually were men who believed this. I used to believe this. This is what I would have taught some years ago, quite a few now, but I would have taught this myself. I don't agree with it any longer, and I'm concerned over the results of believing this doctrine, and that's why I'm taking the time to address it. I believe, personally, we are in the last days. I believe we literally are looking at the possibility of the beginning of the tribulation. I would not be one bit surprised if what we see happening in the Middle East right now is not the beginning of the tribulation. It's a very real possibility. But this theology, and I please don't just shut off everything I say. This theology essentially believes in two comings. In fact, they believe in three comings. They believe in the first coming where Jesus was born in the manger. Then they believe in a second coming where he comes in the clouds above the earth and it's in the clouds that keeps it secret. Nobody knows he's there. And the church ascends from the earth in secret. They just kind of disappear from the earth, you know. I really don't know how they assume that a man who's working next to you in your shop is going to just ascend out of the room and through the roof and disappear right in front of your eyes. And it's going to be a secret. I, I don't think that that's reasonable. But the fact remains is... You know, or if you're a pilot, and, and, and they literally teach this, and then, please, I'm not mocking. I want you to understand I know what they teach. I don't want you to think I'm attacking this position because I'm ignorant of their theology. I know their theology. I've taught it. I've believed it. I just simply have examined it in the Word of God like Oswald J. Smith did and decided it was wrong. Or like G. Campbell Morgan did and decided it was wrong. There are men, great men, who believed it and taught it and they realized, wait a minute, it's not holding up under the pressure of Scripture. But they believe in this, this secret rapture, 
which time this tremendous seven-year tribulation begins and transpires, at the end of which there's a third coming where Jesus literally comes back, puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, and sets up his kingdom. The two comings, the secret and the visible, are separated by a seven-year period called the tribulation. The two comings, the first is a secret rapture. The purpose of that coming is to remove true believers from the earth and take them to heaven. The purpose of that is to keep them from going through the great tribulation that the book of Revelation tells us about. This tribulation, according to this theology, lasts seven years. During this seven-year period, the world comes under the total control of Satan, his Antichrist, and the Antichrist's false prophet. Many, in fact, most that I have read anyway, of those who believe this theology, include in it that the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth during this period. Since that concept is literally ludicrous, that the Holy Spirit will be removed and people will still be getting saved, as this theology believes they will, they have had to adjust that position, and some are now moving away from the idea that the Holy Spirit will be removed. Let me assure you of one thing. The Lord Jesus Christ bought this earth and the rights to it by his life on the cross. He will never give it back to the satanic kingdom. It's just simply not going to happen. The Holy Spirit will never be removed from this earth until Jesus has turned the kingdom over to God the Father forever. The ungodly and worldly people are only going to know that this event has taken place according to this theology because the people have disappeared and there's chaos. That sells movies, and I, quite frankly, it sells books, but I don't think it's biblically sound. Let me say this. This is without exception. Those who hold to this position dogmatically teach that there will be no warning, no indication that the second coming is taking place. Now, let me just say this to you. I believe I'm going to present over the next three to four or five weeks biblical teaching that will dissolve that doctrine. I don't have to defend my position. The Bible so well defends it, it's going to dissolve. I'm sure some of you are nervous because all of a sudden you're facing the reality that it's possible I might go through the tribulation. I've known people that when they heard that, that couldn't sleep for three nights. They don't want to hear that. But I guarantee you, let me just say this to you. One man said to me not too long ago, he said to me, well, I don't believe my father would ever expect me to face that kind of tribulation. And I just looked at him, and quite frankly, it annoyed me that somebody would say that. And the reason it annoyed me is this. I said to him, why? Right now in China, there are Christians suffering as intensely as you can suffer. There is no more ability of the human body to suffer any more than they're suffering right now. And they love the same father you do. What makes you so special that you don't believe your father will make you suffer? My Bible makes it clear that Peter was crucified. All the 11 apostles except John were executed as martyrs. John, it is historically said, was boiled in oil and survived and then was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the Bible. The closest 11 men to Jesus on the face of the earth suffered intensely. Isaiah was cut in half by a saw. Where do we get the idea that God isn't going to let us little New Testament U.S. Christians suffer? That's a lie. There are people right now in countries that the Islamic regimes are moving into villages and chopping the women's arms off and leaving them lay to die because for no other reason than they love Jesus. Please excuse me for my intensity, but I think it is a rather arrogant idea that your father won't let you or me suffer when right now 250,000 Christians a year are being martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. I think there's something that doesn't add up there. On behalf of Pastor Mark Byers and Kingdom Living, thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. 
God has one overarching goal in mind prior to Christ's return, and that is to redeem us from all moral and spiritual impurity. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He intends to return for a glorious church. Let's join Pastor Mark and learn more about this blessed hope as he continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. One man said to me not too long ago, he said to me, well, I don't believe my father would ever expect me to face that kind of tribulation. And I just looked at him, and quite frankly, it annoyed me that somebody would say that. And the reason it annoyed me is this. I said to him, why? Right now in China, there are Christians suffering as intensely as you can suffer. There is no more ability of the human body to suffer any more than they're suffering right now. And they love the same father you do. What makes you so special that you don't believe your father will make you suffer? My Bible makes it clear that Peter was crucified. All the 11 apostles except John were executed as martyrs. John, it is historically said, was boiled in oil and survived and then was exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the Bible. The closest 11 men to Jesus on the face of the earth suffered intensely. Isaiah was cut in half by a saw. Where do we get the idea that God isn't going to let us little New Testament U.S. Christians suffer? That's a lie. There are people right now in countries that the Islamic regimes are moving into villages and chopping the women's arms off and leaving them lay to die because for no other reason than they love Jesus. Please excuse me for my intensity, but I think it is a rather arrogant idea that your father won't let you or me suffer when right now 250,000 Christians a year are being martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. I think there's something that doesn't add up there. We're going to look at their doctrinal position very carefully. I'm going to present it to you today. In this theology's position... The next event on God's timetable is the secret rapture. They're just simply waiting for that to take place. The popular phrase that is used in relationship to this theology is at any moment or the imminent return of Jesus Christ, meaning at any moment. The fact that there isn't any signs to warn the world of this sudden and secret and imminent rapture is an impetus given for the purpose of causing the church to live holy and godly lives. To get ready, to be constantly ready. The second of these two comings, or as I said, the third coming, at the end of the seven year tribulation is a very public affair. And this particular coming, it is very similar to what I believe is going to happen. The Lord is going to come down, put his feet on the Mount of Olives, split the mountain and so forth and establish his kingdom. And that the pre-tribulationist and the post-tribulation people believe the same as far as that coming goes. Where I differ from them is I don't believe there's one seven years earlier. I just simply believe there's one. Jesus will descend from heaven in a cloud in the same way he left the earth in Acts chapter 1 verse 11. And the difference from the secret rapture being that he will descend with his angels and the church are caught up and raised from the dead at the rapture and taken to heaven for seven years. However, at this second rapture or the second coming or the third coming, however you want to reword it, but I'll just use the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Jesus does come with the angels. He comes with the church. He sets up his kingdom and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. Two distinguishing phrases that pre-trib teachers will use is coming for the saints and coming 
with the saints. I will look with you from the scripture to see if those two phrases hold up under careful scriptural scrutiny. We will find out they don't. To make this distinction that he's coming for the saints and with the saints, I will show you those two phrases don't hold any water at all. And I will do that simply with Bible verses. I don't have to give my opinion. I will let the word of God do the speaking. The origin of this word rapture is not a Greek word from the Greek New Testament. It is actually a Latin word from the Vulgate, from raptura. And it is the translation for the word caught up in the verse, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That phrase caught up is the Latin word raptura, and so we get the word rapture from the Latin Vulgate translation. The Greek uses a very different word, but both of them mean caught up. In English, the old English, the archaic English, the word rapture meant to be transported from one place to another. And as we have already seen, when Jesus comes, he's not coming to the whole world. We have already seen that according to the word of God, he's coming to the Mount of Olives, above the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem, to the east of Jerusalem. He's going to ascend to that place, and he's going to send his angels into the world to gather the elect out of the world, and we will be transported to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, above the Mount of Olives, to meet the Lord there. He's not coming to Royal Oak. I'm not going to meet the Lord in the air over Royal Oak. The angels are going to escort us to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus personally, physically returns, according, again, to the Word of God. I would like to just stress, there is no doctrinal disagreement among all these different positions regarding the validity of the rapture itself. The disagreement comes over the issue of when that rapture takes place. Is it a private, secret event, seven years before the millennium begins, or is it a very visible public event that ushers in the millennium? I think that 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, which I just mentioned, is significant, and I read it to you, then we who are alive and remain shall be cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That whole context in 1 Thessalonians 4 is what I consider a significant thing because it doesn't include an answer to this question. To me, that's very significant. Paul is writing in 1 Thessalonians 4, giving us the details of the second coming, and he doesn't give a single indication whether it's before or after the tribulation. It doesn't even hint, let me say this, listen, it doesn't even hint of any awareness that there is even such a question. It doesn't even hint to the idea that the coming could possibly even be before the tribulation. There's no suggestion or hint in the scripture that there is two comings. And if Paul was writing to correct the New Testament church in Thessalonica, why would he leave it out? If it's such an important event. I believe all Bible believing Christians are looking forward. To the rapture of the church. If you aren't looking forward. You are probably loving this world. And need to get before the Lord Jesus and repent. This position that we've been describing. Is the pre-trib rapture positions. That position is of course. That all Christians are going to be removed from the earth. Before the big trouble really begins. Before the great tribulation really begins. Before the the time of Jacob's trouble actually begins. Whereas the post-tribulation. Believes that we will only meet the Lord in the air. After the tribulation. And we are going to pass through all of it. As I said a mid-tribulation position has arisen. But that's very very. A small portion of the church. The main debate that we're going to look at. Is between the pre tribulation rapture and the post or after the tribulation people the history of this doctrine is interesting it begins with an Englishman an Irishman and a Scotsman as I said earlier there was no teaching about it before 1830 except there was an isolated monk that centuries ago made reference to something that was similar but he did not develop the thought it was never published to any degree and there is only basic little references to it in a number of historical writings i would ask you to question this this teaching is not found in the writings of all the church leadership from the advent of the lord jesus and the apostles all the way up 
until it is introduced for the very first time in 1830. Now the scripture is very clear that God reveals his truth throughout all generations. Why is it that we can't find teachers of this position, this pre-tribulation rapture position, being as important as it is, and being the fact that the concept of this doctrine is that literally Jesus could come back at any time from the time he left until now. And we're going to look at the theology of that scripturally. But beyond that, just right now, think of this. If they were taught that Jesus could come back at any moment in the early church, and that the Christians in 100 AD and 200 AD and 300 AD were supposed to believe that Jesus was going to come back possibly at any moment and that they were to be ready. Don't you think that the church leaders would have been writing about it extensively, even as they are right now? But it is dramatically absent from all writings until 1830. That in itself should be flying a giant red flag to any student of the scripture. Why was it never mentioned? Of course, they have an answer for that that we'll get to. Their answer essentially is, didn't apply to them. It did. It did. Because this doctrine believes that Jesus could have come back in the year 1000 or 101. They should have been hearing the teaching and writing about it. It should have been, literally the New Testament should have been full of this kind of teaching. Instead, there's not a single verse that establishes that truth in the whole New Testament. Some people claim that this began through a little lady named Margaret McDonald, who incidentally is very interesting. She was speaking in tongues. She was a spiritual person. I've read a lot about her history. There's a lot written about Margaret McDonald. And Margaret McDonald was literally speaking in tongues 70 years before Azusa Street. She was spirit filled. She loved the Lord. Her and her brother and her sister were tremendous Christians and did a tremendous work of love and kindness. And she had a vision, and this vision was written down, and, and from that vision, people have assumed that Mr. Darby, John Darby, took that vision and, and made up this doctrine. The reality is Mr. Darby was writing things, leading people to believe that he was moving this way two years before she ever had the vision. It is very spurious to think that Margaret MacDonald was the founder of this concept. She was from Port Glasgow, Scotland. There's a number of books that have been written discussing that particular subject. I'll give you the names of them. One is The Great Rapture Hoax by David McPherson. David McPherson is an investigative reporter. He wrote The Great Rapture Hoax, New Puritan Library, 1983. He wrote The Incredible Cover-Up. And he wrote a little booklet called The Rapture by New Puritan Library, 1987. Those three books, if you're interested in doing any kind of extensive study on the origin of the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, this man has spent years studying it, going to England, Scotland, Ireland, and studying the lives and researching them in all sorts of libraries and records of history to find out where this doctrine came from, and he has done a very good job of putting together the information. There was a man named Edward Irving who left the church in Scotland, and he founded what is called the Catholic Apostolic Church. Edward Irving would meet in a building in a place called Albury near Guildford, southwest of London, England, where Dr. Henry Drummond owned this building and allowed them to meet in the library. In this library, Reverend Irvin and Dr. Henry Drummond would put on prophetic conferences and to one of these conferences came a man called Reverend John Nelson Darby. He left the Anglican Church in Dublin, and he is the founder of what is known as the Brethren Denomination that is a worldwide denomination today. It is John Darby, without a doubt, who has made dispensational, premillennial, pre-tribulation, rapture doctrine popular. He's the founder of it. He was the promoter of it. He was the originator of it, and I am convinced that's the exact truth. He was the originator of it, not the Holy Spirit, and he wrote about it, and he began promoting it, and he was a strong 
leader in the Brethren movement. And many among his own movement, the Brethren movement, rejected what he was teaching when he was introducing it. Let me give you the name of one of those men. How many of you have ever heard of George Mueller? Of the orphanage fame in Bristol? George Mueller personally resisted and stood against and refuted John Darby about this doctrine, believing it was heretical. Now, I want you to know something. We know the character of George Mueller. How many of you even ever heard of John Darby before I told you about him? Raise your hands. How many of you never heard of John Darby till I said something? How many of you heard of George Mueller before I mentioned him? You all know about George Mueller. We know who George Mueller is historically because we know the character of this man of God and the fruit of his life. George Mueller withstood Darby personally when he was introducing this doctrine to the church for the first time. That, and again, should be another one of those big red flags causing people to say, wait a minute, if George Mueller was resisting this, what is there about this doctrine that he felt so impelled to resist it? However, the amazing thing is this doctrine became the orthodox teaching of the brethren and it began to spread and few dared to resist it by the end of the 1800s. Darby moved into the U.S. and was introduced to a man named Dr. C.I. Schofield, who incidentally was a lawyer. Schofield took this doctrine, studied it, continued to enlarge upon it, and then he took Darby's teaching and he did something that as far as I know, I've read this to be the case. I can't verify this is absolute, but I know that it is essentially true as far as I'll say it. And then you can understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. Schofield was, I've been told, the first to incorporate Bible notes into Scripture. No one had dared to interject in the pages of the Bible their own thoughts until Schofield did. And the main purpose of the Schofield Bible was to promote the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. Schofield had some decent answers. I will give him this. Uh, during a time when Darwin, incidentally, Darwin was also functioning in 1850. He, he would, had written his thesis concerning evolution and so forth, the origin of species and, and the different things that he introduced to the world. This was going on, and what was known as higher critics became popular in the world, and these higher critics began to attack Scripture as being ridiculous because of what was being found scientifically and what Darwin was saying. In Schofield, he began to put some statements in the Bible that were good statements because they gave at least some decent answers for the average Christian to read to refute higher critics and men like Darwin and company. And so his Bible became very popular because the farmer in Kansas that was reading the Bible and he was hearing on the radio or reading in the newspapers or wherever at the time and the foundation of creation was being attacked by Darwinism and he's not educated enough to sort it all out. He reads Schofield and Schofield gives him answers. You can be sure he respected Schofield and so do I for doing so. The problem is he incorporated not only that kind of teaching, he incorporated John Darby's eschatological teaching and that was the thing that was so deadly the Schofield Bible became so popular that without a doubt it was a bestseller and of all the influences that has promoted the pre-tribulation rapture theology it has been without a doubt the Schofield reference Bible to this day Schofield's been dead for a hundred years to this day, there are people so committed to Schofield's writings that if you dare refute him, it's almost sacrilegious to them. My first Bible was a Schofield Bible. I've read Schofield's Bible. I've read his notes. I believed them. Until all of a sudden I started really getting into the scripture and find out things weren't adding up. I would like to also say something right now that I'm going to enlarge on in the next few minutes that you need to hear. Some of this stuff, for some of you, it may not make any sense or you don't even understand why you need to know it. But I'm not just teaching to one or two. I'm teaching to everybody here. And I've got students of the Bible here. And I have to make sure I teach this in such a way that it is irrefutable. I have a mandate from heaven to speak to the city of Detroit and warn them. 
that they are about to face tribulation. And that's one of the reasons I'm on the radio today. I didn't choose to be on the radio. I wasn't looking to go on the radio. I resisted going on the radio. God forced me to go on the radio. And the reason my program is even on the radio is because God's put me there. And now I have become aware that this message must get out. Because there are literally tens of thousands of Christians who are believing a lie that is making them be unprepared for the coming of the Lord. They're not even watching. They are simply relaxing, knowing or believing without any doubt. They're going up when things get bad and they're not. And they're emotionally not prepared and spiritually unprepared for what's coming on the face of the earth. It's important to know this. Hear me. John Darby's teaching on end times does not stand on its own. It is like a leg on a three-legged chair. There are other legs holding it up, and the other legs are called dispensationalism. Schofield's Bible promoted dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is the framework of Darby's doctrine. And there are people today who accept dispensationalism without even a thought that maybe it's not right. Because it is so popular. Darby's concept was based on a verse in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And he took this phrase, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he decided that we need to divide the message of the Bible up. And he conveniently divides it up into what is called seven dispensations. That word, rightly dividing the word of truth, is better translated by these translations. The Revised Standard Version, rightly explaining the word of truth. Or the New American Standard, handling accurately the word of truth. Or the NIV, who correctly handles the word of truth. God wasn't saying that we should divide the word of God up. He was saying that we need to be careful that as we divide it and we begin looking at it, that we properly understand and dissect what it's saying. His method of dividing the scripture up went too far in at least three directions. Firstly, he divided biblical history into seven separate eras or dispensations, which gives his theology the name dispensationalism. He divides the history of the Bible up into seven dispensations. Here's what Schofield says a dispensation is. And Schofield was a student of Darby, a personal friend, a promoter of Darby's own teaching. Schofield defines a dispensation as a period of time during which man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Listen. How many of you know that since the fall, there isn't a test man can have that he won't fail? God doesn't need any more tests. Man has already failed the final exam. When he was in the Garden of Eden, he said, don't eat of that tree. And he ate. That was the end of the tests. From there on, he said, there's no man that doeth good. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none righteous. The poison of asps is under their tongues. There's no fear of God before their eyes. How can he test somebody in that state? He also says that we are dead in trespasses and sins outside of the commonwealth of God. Thank you for joining us today for Kingdom Living, sponsored by Calvary Christian Church.